doing audio branding very often is um you know has very similarities to a coaching has is always a change project uh, a change management um, process yeah and it's also iterative so it's always repeating the same procedures a couple of times until yes you get closer and closer to something that everybody agrees is okay that's that's the goal and by the way goals are the most important thing if not if it's not clear where you want to go what you need and why you are doing this if you just just uh, follow the next hype and say, oh, okay, yes, we need a sound logo. We just like our competitors. Then you're lost. Then you're just wasting time and money. Welcome to Audio Branding, the hidden gem of marketing. Sound plays a more important role in human behavior and our decision-making than you may realize. In this podcast, I'll help you understand the art and science of sound, so you can better influence others in business and your life. I'm your host, Jody Krangle. Let's delve a little deeper. This is the second part of my Clubhouse recording on the power of audio branding. So actually, along those lines, I'm curious, and I'm going to go uh, down the, the panelists here, if you could answer this for me. What's the first question that you ask a new client when you're trying to figure out who they are audibly? Is there, you know, you don't have to go through your whole process or anything, but maybe like, what's the first thing that you do ask them? I'm curious, Gina, what do you think? I just let them talk for a little bit because generally the concept is music, like I said, um, or it's just like one singular thought. So I kind of let them talk for a little bit, maybe bring up some examples of songs that they might feel that they're connected to. And, and then depending on like how it's going, then I will start putting in sounds and see like, for example, an example that I use a lot is REI. Um, I don't know if that's an uh, international company or just the States, but REI is an outdoor camping and activity company. And so I use the idea of the sounds that I attribute with REI would be crackling fires, uh, snapping of twigs, birds, uh, you know, like a babbling brook, that sort of thing. And uh, when I put that into perspective, I, I can see people kind of light up and go, oh, that's what you mean. Because it just, it, it doesn't just, you know, come to them. It has to be explained. But once you really like put it into perspective and build context, people get really excited. And then the exciting part of it is that you kind of put like this nugget of an idea in there and then you watch it like grow. Um, because I mean, I can, I can help people to like start to persuade them into thinking about it, but they know their brand better than I ever will. And so that's the exciting part is what's great. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely a good way to, to start the conversation and get them talking. <laughs> I like it a lot. Yes. Okay, Laurie, that is, that's how about right you? There. Um, well, my first question uh, generally for clients is just to let them describe how they feel that their brand sounds at the moment. And what's interesting about that is that normally um, the answers don't really um, connect to sounds. They are more words that they would like their brand to be. They, they, they often tell us that, okay, our brand sounds trustworthy and, and um, friendly and so on. And, and then I try to dig deeper. Okay, you say trustworthy, but what does that actually mean in sound for you? How does trustworthy sound? What, what does um, make your brand sound trustworthy? So it's, it's quite an interesting conversation um, to start off with the client because um, you can tell that they uh, normally they, they don't think about sound that much and actually talking about sounds and, and how their brand sound sounds is, is quite difficult for them. So um, I actually use um, tools to, to kind of um, get, get the client to open up to, to talk about different sounds and, and, and how they maybe would like to sound and, and so forth. But it's, it's always a very interesting conversation um, to have with people who don't work with sound every day who, well, basically are just regular sure. music listeners. Yeah. So, so um, yeah, it's, it's very interesting. Uh, very similar. Uh, get them talking about music because it, it, you know, it's a personal thing. And my favorite question is if you and I were going to take a road trip, 
what three artists would you want to have? Ooh, that's and right. And, and it kind of puts a little bit of a, you know, uh, 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 an emotion in their head and they start thinking about, you know, not so much, this is a business and, you know, but we're going to be in the car, hopefully in a convertible driving down the highway. Right. And, um, a, a great recent example is a, a, a new, a uh, client that I just started a podcast for CEO of a really successful company. Um, and, and she's, she's going to have a great podcast cause she's just, you know, a, a real character and very smart in her industry. Um, and, uh, but we weren't really sure what we were going to do music wise. And I said, you know, let's, let's say you and I are going to take a road trip. Who are we listening to name three? And it was like, you know, uh, Smokey Robinson, Marvin Gaye, and Diana Ross. And I'm like, I, I have this all figured out already, <laughs> right? Uh, we're we're going to find some really cool music that you are going to love. And then I went to the music libraries that I go to for podcasts and just tried to find, you know, three or four examples that, that really kind of fit with those artists and, and, you know, the, right away there was there was one or two that she just loved and um and you know that's where um i think you don't want to give a client just something that they love only but something that actually fits their personality and 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 hopefully um her clients and colleagues personalities yeah, and, and just something say. that kind of fits yeah um and and then i had another one recently who um the uh, the marketing director of that brand sent me the CEO's Spotify playlist, and I'm like, this is pure gold. I can I can look through this playlist uh, that they use for their annual conference, and and I can figure out you know some songs that would be what their corporate team is kind of used to hearing when they all get together for their powwows and everything, right? Thanks. So um, so yeah, that that whole finding out what they um, really see themselves listening to. Um, I, I think that's a, a, a great way to start. Fantastic. Yeah, definitely. I think there's also um, a, a, a sort of Venn diagram, I guess, between what they love and what they feel the people that want their product or service would love. Yeah, right. Yeah. And, and I, I think where we get into trouble with this is if somebody has just some wild taste in music that it's like, well, your customers probably aren't going to appreciate that. <laughs> but, but if it's something that's popular enough, I, I think that's a, a pretty good way. to. Yeah, go. that makes a lot of sense. Shez, what about you? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I echo so many of the same sentiments. It's all always starts with a conversation. And to Gina's point, you want to get the person you're speaking with, you want to hear them talk, uh, especially about themselves and how they perceive themselves to Steve's point about perception. How does the client perceive themselves? Um, and there's usually, you know, there's usually a disconnect as, as Lowry mentioned in terms of how they perceive themselves and what they're actually omitting to the market sonically. There's, there's a disconnect between, um, how they either aspire to be or think they are perceived. And that doesn't usually match up with, um, you know, most of the time with what's going on in terms of their communication sonically. And that's always a good place to just dig in and get the conversation started. And, um, you know, you start to uncover um, a lot of important stuff there. So that, that's, that's my great. experience. Yeah. Steve, what about you? What's the first question you ask? Uh, well, that's a, I've been sitting here thinking about how I might respond to that. And the first thing I would say is that these questions come at different points in the process. Uh, so when I'm beginning the process with a brand, I I'm really less concerned about what they think about how, what their sonic identity is. I'm more interested in discovering about the brand itself. There's a lot of discovery interviews. There's looking at brand collateral. There's looking at equity studies, research that I can find, taking a look at how the brand has shown up uh, in a lot of different audio touch points, looking at competitors. Once we get past that, and I have a real good understanding of the brand, when we actually get into developing a brand profile, my tact is 
usually to begin to build an idea of a of a sonic persona, for lack of a better word. Um, and so our workshops are, are designed to try to take people out of putting themselves on the brand and stepping back and thinking about the brand itself in some type of a semiotic uh, framework. So we'll, you know, I'll often ask questions around how would you represent your brand if it were an archetype? You know, is it a jester? Yeah, yeah. Is it a sage? Is it, is it a, is it a lover starting there? Then when we look at brand attributes and you're starting to use words like, you know, confident or happy or caring um, now we've got a framework where we're starting to think about those emotions, um, you know, in an, in an archetypal framework, uh, you know, so if, if the brand, you know, were to talk to you, what would the brand's voice sound like? Is it male? Is it female? Is it neither of those? Uh, if the brand was going to give you a playlist, what would be on their, Pandora playlist. Um, what <laughs> radio stations would they be listening to? Uh, yeah, so so it's it's hard to condense it to one question. But if I were to talk about sonic profiling and a place to start, I would probably start with an archetypal framework because that's less about um, music and emotion, and it's more about semiotics and meaning. And that, to me, drives decisions that you're going to make around what is the emotional framework that you're going to to try to tap into and how does that relate back to the essence of the wonderful yeah brand. and i know you mentioned archetypes in our interview so uh, yeah hearkening back to that <laughs> that's fantastic are you looking for ways to improve your company's or podcast's impact You'd be surprised how powerful the use of an intentional audio branding strategy can be. Want to know more? I have a free downloadable PDF that gives you my five tips for implementing an intentional audio strategy at voiceoversandvocals.com slash audio dash branding dash strategy. That location does ask to put you on a mailing list just to send you updates on when the new podcasts come out. But if you really don't want to give your email out, I understand. Just contact me directly. My email is all over my website, and I'll make sure you get that PDF without needing to sign up anywhere. If you do sign up, though, you also get access to a resources section called The Studio, where I have videos, white papers and PDFs, discounts from my guests, and snippets of audio from my guests that no one else gets to hear. So maybe it's worth your while. Totally up to you. And of course, if you're looking for voiceovers, you can get in touch with me about that too. Now, back to the podcast. Cornelius, what about you? The first question would be, would be how do you do? How do you feel? Uh, but then the second question would be, what do you need? And so I, I always start with the point of needs and I want to make sure if we really understand the needs of our clients why did they approach us what what do they think they need and uh, why are they looking for somebody like we sound to help them and um, I have to say um, actually um, my closest um, answer would be to to this one so we uh, we have pretty much the same approach so can just um, copy that, copy and paste for this. Um, but let's save time. Um, so once we 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 heard from the client what they at that point of time think that they need, or what they want, then we start a process of raising awareness for the sound cosmos to sensitize them to find a common language, how to talk about things they are not used to talk about. It's very, very difficult. This is very often the, the critical point. Yeah? If, we, if we find um, a common way, a language, whatever, communication, how to talk about this, I, I don't agree with the, um, for example, we would never uh, maybe ask for, for artists as uh, Jack uh, is, is doing, but it's, it's, I can understand this because he's coming from a different approach from the radio and from the podcasting thing. Um, but 
talking about an artist where there would be so much non-musical aspects, yeah, like if you talk about Michael Jackson, actually, what are we talking about? His gloves, his shoes, um, his dancing style, the stories around Michael Jackson, or do we talk about the music uh, of Michael Jackson or his voice? So many things. So we try to keep it um, on an abstract level as long as possible. And then, of course, later on, we can also talk about artists because then you would say, it's the singer, not the song. So it's a different story. Be careful about this. So once we we, we found some conversation, and so then we start the reframing progress um, process, and uh, that that ends in a rebriefing and asking again the same question. Okay, what do you now think do you need? And I can tell you, it's very often totally different answer. That's interesting. The first time in their um, response we, to you yeah. changes depending, like as you re ask the same question as you discuss this. Yes, it's a it's a actually, you know, doing audio branding very often is um, you know has very similarities to a coaching has is always a change project a, a change management um, process yeah. And it's also iterative, so it's always repeating the same procedures a couple of times until. Yes, you get closer and closer to something that everybody agrees is okay. That's that's the goal. And by the way, goals are the most important thing. If not, if it's not clear where you want to go, what you need, and why you are doing this, if you just just uh, follow the next hype and say, "Oh, okay, yes, we need a sound logo. We just like our competitors," then you're lost. Then you're just wasting time and money. So, um, and very often, I would say, almost every time we. We start with a process and then in this very important phase of the process in the beginning, redefining the project, yeah? rebriefing, um, reframing the whole thing. Yeah? Uh, if you get the chance, because it's, I think the most ch biggest challenge is to, to convince the client that they trust you, that they join you in this journey, let's say it, yeah? And to find out what are exactly your pain points. And then if we know about that, then we can ask other questions. Yeah? And if they want to know how, what's the sound for my brand value X, then we can yeah, um, yeah. have a discussion. That's actually this. really kind of profound, yeah. Cornelius, <laughs> because I, I love how you ask the question multiple times. And as they understand more of what they need, they answer you differently. <laughs> And and we um, we learn exactly. about the client. And at the end, um, somebody here already said it, uh, saying like they are the professionals of their brands. They have so much knowledge about the brand. Some people are working twenty years for this for the brand. Yeah? Um, so we will never be ha we have more knowledge. So we have to work with these. It's always a co-working process. Uh, and, and actually, we, we are learning yeah, from the Yeah, and I think there's the something time. to be said for being slightly on the outside because, you know, as an audio branding professional, you guys mm -hmm. see things that maybe the company or the people in the company who've been there for so long don't see. So, yeah, I guess that's it's sort of getting down to the, the, the nitty gritty of what makes them really who they are which I think is a, a fantastic process. And I know every one of you have a different way of doing this. <laughs> so it's, it's actually really fascinating. Um, and hopefully the, the, you know, if you're listening to this, you're finding this as fascinating as I am. Um, Alex, I wanted to ask you too, because I know that you kind of do this on your end as well, don't you? Yeah. So I definitely think that massive and the work that I do fall more on the side of what Cornelius and Steve have been talking about. Um, the process when we're dealing with clients and people in general is everyone, <laughs> everyone thinks they know what they like and what they want, but coming at it again from sort of a science perspective, but also from the marketing perspective, what they want and what they think they know is often not actually what they will be uh, happy with as yeah. a final product. And so we do just, as Steve was saying, um, Massive also goes through so much brand research, you know, stakeholder uh, interviews and really trying to understand what they want the sound of the brand to be outside of um people that they know, you know, we'll try and create um, examples of artists they've never heard of 
so that they can say, oh, I like how this sounds, but I don't, you know, I can't say, oh, this is Mia, you know, this is an artist I know, now I'm going to be biased and think that that's what I want. You know, we're more focused on figuring out what the brand is trying to say and whether we as an agency understand how they think that should sound. Because often the way that I think of a, you know, they say fearless, for instance, a song that I might associate with fearless might not be the way that this client thinks of the word fearless. And so it's a conversation, but we try to stay pretty away from anything they've ever heard yeah, before. Yeah. Because, and, and it's the same with the research aspect behind what I do, because it's music is going to affect you in ways that you think you do. And that's the whole problem, or, you know, that is the big roadblock to, I think, so much of this industry is trying to convince and educate people that what they think they know might, or what they think they want, isn't necessarily what they're going to end up being happy with. And that's such a difficult conversation and educational well, process to go really through with every client you, Alex. but it's so why do you important. think they wouldn't be happy with it if they just went the direction of what they like what's what's the the reasoning as to why they wouldn't like what they ended up with well so first of all there's the option that every person's opinion oh, yeah. is going to be different and so um you know what their head of marketing decides that they like um, you know, Bonnie Vare as their sound might not actually resonate with the what all everyone in the company wants. But also, you know, we would have so many Lady Gaga, Beyonce tracks <laughs> okay, in the marketing point, world yeah. <laughs> if we just did that. <laughs> and it wouldn't it wouldn't work. It wouldn't be effective. And I think that's the you know because what people care about is ROI. You know, what is the sort of you, what is the change that this audio brand is going to provide? And if it was just chucking Barry Manilow in a studio 10 minutes before the ad airs, as it has been for so long, it's not going to have the potential, it doesn't have the potential to change as much as a more thoughtful audio yeah. strategy would have, would bring. I think you've got a client problem there though. If, if, if you have to wait for them to approve a song um, you're, you're losing already. You know, I, I, I think I want to work with clients who trust me enough to say, here you go. Here's what your podcast is going to sound like. Here's what your music's going to sound like. And, and, and so forth. I, I, I wouldn't work with someone who, you know, wanted to force mm -hmm. a Barry Manilow song on it, right? Like, I, I think, I think that's <laughs> well, a, I, I don't necessarily a think that Alex was suggesting that's a good thing. <laughs> Or that he would let that happen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I Jack, we're saying the same that. thing. Yes. <laughs> so the idea is to lead them in a direction that maybe is the road less traveled so that they can make their own unique, you know, sound. Is that, am I getting it right? Okay. <laughs> okay. I know that we're all dealing with a lot these days, so I really wanted to acknowledge those that have gone out of their way to leave an honest review of this podcast. Like Mary, who writes, Interesting how audio and sound makes a big difference in marketing and branding. Thanks for sharing a lot of valuable information. Keep up the good work. Thanks so much, Mary. I'm really glad you're finding the podcast useful. And for those of you that are interested, you can also leave a voice review now off of the main podcast page. It's super simple, and I'd love to hear what you think. Now, back to the show. If Jody, if I could just add to, to Jack's point and to Alex's point. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Um, there are those situations where you're going to have a CMO or a CEO that can push back. I mean, I have seen Sonic branding initiatives derailed entirely because upper management hasn't been involved in the process until they get to the end and then they hear something and, you know, it doesn't strike them the right way. So you have to, you know, if you're going to do this work, there's a dance that goes on yeah, with it. That, you know, totally you, agree. That, you're, it, you're, it, 
That's a yeah. that's a selling problem, not a not an audio branding problem. Right. It, yeah. You, you've got exactly. to sell it up front that here's what we're going to do, right? And and we're going to create this thing, and and you can use it or you can not use it, right? But, yeah. But it, this is what we're going to create for you. Right. I mean, and, and I'm sure some of my other colleagues probably have similar stories, but you know, I can think of a particular brand where. Um, we worked really hard to get the business and then we got into the, you know, designing a, a, a Sonic logo and the CMO had a particular vision that they were pushing. And we finally resigned the account because I said, if you go down this road, you're going to be coming back to me saying, Oh, we made a mistake and we've spent all this money <laughs> yeah. and I, I, I can't be there for that. And, um, and, and in that, that particular CMO- instance, the, yeah, that's how, that that's most how CMOs are in their job for 18 months right now. Uh, Steve, I'm, I'm betting either that CMO is gone or they will be within six months, right? Like, you know, I, I don't know. That doesn't sound like someone that you wanted to work with long term, I'm guessing. Well, I mean, we would have loved to work with the brand long term, but that particular individual driving that strategy you know i mean to your point jack you as a audio branding company sonic branding company uh you have to be empowered by the client um and that empowerment sometimes is also being empowered by the brand to push back against an advertising agency that may have a particular creative yeah. agenda in mind. So, you know, you the, the work is fraught with uh, the need for diplomacy. So, uh, and particularly as you get more global clients, uh, clients where there's more stakeholders. So, you know, you have to have skills to to navigate that at the end of the day, um, which mm-hmm. sometimes well, just uh, comes Steve, with you, the, you definitely have territory. a leg up with that uh, psychology degree <laughs> or almost psychology degree. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, my, my undergrad degrees in psychology, but yeah, I, I very often joke that I'm as much a brand therapist in doing this work as, as anything, because very often you, you're in doing the work, you uncover disconnects in relationships. You uncover where teams aren't communicating to each other. You uncover territorial rivalries. And very often part of the work becomes navigating these discussions um, and, you know, trying to counsel the parties to bring them together, uh, you know, in unity to hold hands and and sing, I'd like to teach the world to sing (laughs) in perfect harmony. Who sang it? That was Don Draper, right? Oh, okay. Sorry. He's yeah, he's joking. The season, thank you, Steve. The season finale of Mad Men. Spoiler alert. Watch um, you, Steve. Before we Appreciate call it you, man. A, a day here. Um, this has been really fantastic. I want to let Cheryl uh, have her say for uh, for a moment. Uh, do you have a question or comment, Cheryl? Yes, I do, Jody. Thank you so much for bringing me up on stage. And I've really loved this conversation. And I raised my hand initially, Jack, when you talked about the question about the three songs someone would listen to if you're on a a, a road trip. And I, if one of the questions that I ask on my podcast to all of my guests, Jody being one of them, who has been one of them, is if there was a soundtrack to your life, what would be on it and why? And it's so interesting that sometimes the answer is completely in alignment with the conversation that we've had. And other times (laughs) there's been answers that have been just you would not have expected that from that person just based on the conversation and getting to know who they are in, you know, our 45 minutes to an hour of my podcast. So um, I. I mean, there's so much information and and knowledge here on this panel about why that question, you know, could be, you know, good or it could be a stumbling block. But I just kind of wanted to offer that up for whatever it means is that sometimes there's insight or could be insight into your client, if you will. I'm not speaking about clients. I'm speaking about guests. But sometimes there could be insights into your client 
that you just never would have expected. So anyway, I just wanted to thank, thank you, you and offer yeah, that up. And it, it's a good point. And it certainly adds a, another facet, I think, to the personalities that come on your podcast. <laughs> And uh, yeah, with that, I think we're going to call it an afternoon. Well, it's afternoon here. I know it's not for you, Cornelius, <laughs> or for Laurie. <laughs> yes, good night. Yes. Yeah, no, Thank that, that so would be good night for us. <laughs> yeah, Gina, go ahead. Lunchtime here. Okay, yes. Yeah, you're a little earlier. Yes, the West Coast. Oh, I was Coast. just saying okay. lunchtime here. <laughs> we have people from all over, which I love. And thank you so much to everyone who came up and spoke on stage and, and my very knowledgeable panelists. I really appreciate every one of you putting in your uh, your two cents here because it's a lot of really great information and I'm looking forward to uh, sharing it with folks at a later date. But uh, for now, I think we're going to call it. If you are interested in joining the Power of Sound Club, you can click on the little greenhouse at the top there. And I believe our next discussion in a week is going to be specifically about podcasting. So uh, please do join us and uh, thank you so much. Um, hope to see you again next Wednesday at 2 p.m. Eastern. Have a wonderful rest of your day or evening or afternoon. Well, that's the end of this episode. Thanks for listening. And if you like what you heard, why not tell a friend about this podcast? It's available in all the usual locations. Until next time. Until next time.